in the valley Come and lift your voice All those on the mountain top be glad Shout for joy Rise up and praise Him He deserves our love Rise up and praise Him Worship the Holy One with all your heart all your soul About the four winds, caught up in the 
heavenly sound Let praises echo from the towers of cathedral To the faithful gathered underground Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation Some were meant to persist Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples None rings truer than this It's all God's children singing Glory, glory Hallelujah, He reigns, He reigns. It's all God's children singing, glory, glory. Hallelujah, He reigns. It's all God's children singing. Cause all the powers of darkness Can't drown out a single word No, no, no way And all God's children sing out glory, glory Hallelujah, He reigns He reigns It's all God's children sing It's all God's people singing glory, glory, hallelujah, He reigns, He reigns. It's all God's people singing glory, glory, hallelujah, He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. All God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. There's no rock, there's no God like our God. of salvation he cannot be moved he's proven himself to be faithful and true there is no rock there is no God like God rock there's no rock there is no God like our God no other name worthy of all
Philippians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. I'm going to ask you to turn there, if you would, please. If you've already noticed, the message titled today is The Joy of Having Spiritual Friends. You know, we couldn't have just done what we have just done if it weren't for spiritual friends, am I right? Couldn't just do that with anybody, could you? Boy, ain't it good to have spiritual friends. If you remember, I said that that uh, Philippians, which is what we're going to be doing a, uh, a study through, uh, Philippians is the, known as the epistle of what? Joy. Some of you remember. Amen. The epistle of joy. And if you remember last week, we talked about one of the joys we can take is in the confidence of knowing that God is totally in charge of our salvation. Remember? That He takes us from, from the point that He chose us all the way to the point where we stand before Him in glory, He is totally in charge of that. And we can take joy in knowing that it's not our work, it's not our efforts, it's solely Him. I don't know, I take great joy in that. Do you? I do. Well, I want to talk about another uh, part of joy that we can get from, from uh, our, our walk with Christ, and that is the joy of having spiritual friends. Again, looking at Philippians Chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. I don't know how important it is to you. It is very important to me to have spiritual friends. Christian brothers and sisters. I don't have as many as I would like to have. That's my fault. It is totally my fault. I don't make as much time as I should. And um, I publicly reprimand myself for that. We need spiritual friends. We need to be surrounded by them. Because I tell you what, we can walk out the doors of this church and then we stand out in the world and we get all kinds of beat up sometimes, don't we? Boy, if we, need, we need spiritual friends in this, in this world and it's going to be more so, even more that we're going to need those friends. The joy of having spiritual friends. Now, if you'll go back to chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 7 and 8, let's read this together. Paul says this, he says, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. The joy of having spiritual friends. Paul tells us, here that uh, in this letter that he wrote, he says that he has a deep, abiding, strong, committed, tolerant love for his brothers and sisters at the Philippian church. It's a love that's developed over time because they've been actively participating in his ministry, supporting him financially. They've been giving him encouragement. They've been giving him moral support. Uh, and so he, 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 he's developed his affection for them, not just because of what they've done for him, but that's deepened his affection. And Paul says here in verse 7, he says, it is only right for me to feel this way about you. When he says right, he's saying it's only morally and ethically right for me to have this spiritual love for you. It's the right thing. It's a moral thing. It's a deep spiritual thing. It's a right attitude that I have towards you. It's an attitude that comes from his heart. And if you look through the scriptures, heart always refers to the mind, the will, and the emotions. It's a deep love. So Paul says, I love you, church. I love you, my brothers and sisters at the Philippian church. I love you with all my heart, my mind, my will, and my emotions. It comes from deep within. This love, this affection. It's an attitude of the heart, of the mind, of the will. And you know what? It's expected. And it's required. It's a love that Paul has, but it's expected of Paul, and it's required of Paul. Which means that it's expected and required of all followers of Christ, Christians. This affection, this love, this deep, tolerant, genuine affection for others. We're going to talk about that. 
A, a, a spiritual love that we should have amongst our spiritual friends that's tolerant, deep, and genuine. It's expected and it's required. When I say expected, I'm saying it's a natural response. If Eric Schaefer is a Christian, if he's truly saved, born through Christ and what he's done, then it's expected of me, it's a natural response of me to love and have a deep affection for my brothers and sisters. Do you hear me on that? It is just a natural response. Now I want you to go to 1 John, if you would please. We're going to look at a few scriptures this morning. 1 John, you're going to take a right. Go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Great text about love amongst the brethren, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. Look at that last part. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is what? Love. Also, I want you to look at 1 John 3.14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we what? Love the brethren. He who does not love, he who does not love abides in death. It is expected, it's a natural response of the Christian to love his brothers and sisters. This is a test for the faithless. A test for the faithless. If you can't love the brethren, then your faith is suspect. Because Scripture tells us that if you don't love the brethren, you don't love God. And love comes from God. God is love. If you don't love the brethren, your faith is suspect. Also, it's required. It's an obedience to Christ. Now go to John chapter 15. It's a natural response of being saved. But then in chapter 15 of John, verse 12, we find that it is required. 15, 12 of John. This is my commandment, Jesus says, that you love one another just as I have loved you. It's a commandment. So it's expected of us. It's a natural response, but it's also required. It's an obedience to Christ. This is a test of obedience. We've already seen the test of faith. If you're saved, you're going to love the brethren. If you're not obedient to Christ, then you are probably not loving the brethren. So this is a test of obedience. It's expected and it is required. You know, we're amazed how sometimes we're in the life of a church and we see the lack of love amongst some people. We're amazed by that. We're amazed when maybe a church member who's been in the church for 30 years acts out and creates dissension in the life of the church or creates problems and they may know the Bible from front to back and can quote scripture, got it memorized. They're here every Sunday. They've been here 30 years in the life of the church and yet they can be disruptive and angry and resentful and don't seem to have the love of their brethren. And we're amazed by that. How does that happen? George Barna. I don't know if you know George Barna. George Barna is a uh, uh, religion research analyst. He does surveys. He's known across the world as being the top of his trade. Great at putting together surveys and coming up with uh, criteria and, and analysis of, of the Christian faith and other religions. He's a Christian. George Barna says that 50% of church members are lost. Say, so that's just George Barna. Now, let me add to that. Bill Bright, founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, he also believes that 50% of church members are lost. 
Ah, well, Eric, that's, that's just Bill Bright. Billy Graham says, Billy Graham believes that 80% of church members are lost. I can't tell you that I know. But I do know that I'm greatly concerned when people within the life of the church are disruptive and hurtful. And it's probably no surprise that probably many of those are lost. They don't know Christ. 2 Corinthians 13.5, let me just read that to you. Paul again tells us something, admonishes us to do something. If I ever get there. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? I'm going to tell you there are two tests. There are many tests. There are two tests. One, do you love the brethren? It's expected. It's a natural response of being saved. And are you obedient to Christ? Are you obedient in loving the brethren? There's a test. I was in uh, Tanzania, Africa, uh, preaching. Y'all have known I've done that. And I, I, I hate to keep going back there, but I just such a rich, rich experience that change your heart and your life. And, and um, I was preaching, again, out in the bush, way, way out past civilization. And uh, I was out there preaching. There was this crowd, and we're all sitting under the trees and, and, and had an interpreter. And I always tried to inject uh, Swahili words into my message so that I could at least... They know I was trying. So uh, I decided I was going to use, I was talking about a lion in Swahili, a lion in Swahili is Simba. So I, I, I was going to say that Simba, the lion, is in the village. And we were in a village. And so I said, Simba is in the village. Well, as soon as I said Simba, you could all see them look because I said Swahili, something in Swahili. That, it, was, it just caught their attention. But then when the interpreter said Simba is in the village. You could see them do this. I it never crossed my mind. You know, it just never crossed my mind. And, you know, that was not far removed from, from, from their life, was a lion in a village. And they just looked, and, and, and then I realized what I had done. I want to tell you, Simba is in the church. Satan is in the church. Every church. 1 Peter 5.8 talks about he seeks to destroy you and devour you like a roaring lion. Satan's best way to destroy the church is to destroy the people. To disrupt. To anger. Cause dissension. Simba is alive and well. How do we develop Christian friends? How, 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 do, we, how do we nurture the, the love and the, the affinity for each other, the attraction for each other, the spiritual? How do we nurture that as, as brothers and sisters in Christ? I want to do better at that. I, I, I want to just be connected to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I, I want to develop this. Well, I, I want to talk about Three different things about that. Number one is, I want to talk about connect on an earthly level. We need to connect on an earthly level. If you notice the church uh, with Paul, they, they unselfishly and sacrificially stood by him. They encouraged him. They alleviated his suffering. They met his needs. Well, let's use that as an example. And again, if you'll notice there in Philippians... He says, I have in you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, y'all are partakers of grace with me. In his imprisonment, while he was in prison, and he wrote this letter while he was in prison, he's talking about the fact that they met his needs. Well, how do we meet each other's needs? On the earthly realm, in, in the physical realm, here. Not spiritual, but earthly. How do we connect on an earthly level? I want to suggest a few things, if I may. Number one, I want to just suggest that we think about each other. Boy, that's earth-shattering, isn't it? 
We just think about each other. Remember each other. And may I, may I suggest that we re remember the good things. We can always find the bad things because I've messed up and said things, you know, to somebody that I shouldn't have said and, and stuff in this church. I've, I've, I've aggravated some of y'all and, and just being stupid. Forgive me for being stupid sometimes. And let's remember the good things. But remember... I, I, and, and look at First Philippians, or look at Philippians 1, 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. You know what? Paul was remembering them. They were on his mind. I got an email this week. I think it was the beginning of the week. And it was just, I, I think I'm on this lady's email list. And I'm okay with that. There's a lot of email lists I ask people to get me off of. Stuff like, Obama drove the jet that flew into the Pentagon. Stupid stuff like that. I don't want to see that stuff. I don't have time for that stuff. So a lot of those, I just bleep and kill them. You know, chain letters. If you'll send this in, you'll get a million dollars next week. Stupid stuff like that. I don't have time for that. But this email, I really like. I like being on this, this email uh, list. In fact, I, I brought the picture that the person sent to me. Will y'all show the bird picture for me? Some of y'all probably got, are on this list. And, and this sweet sister in Christ sent me this, and there was this scripture attached with it, and the scripture basically that God puts his wings and covers us, protects us. And, and that was, the, isn't that a great picture? Can y'all see that? Isn't that awesome? And so just built me up. But you know what? And thank you, take that off. Is, is my sister remembered me. And it just thrilled me. That she remember me. I had a phone call from one of our sisters this week, and, and I, I wasn't there to get the call, and she left a message just said, hey, I, I, I want to uh, give you this scripture and, and just thinking of you. And it just encouraged me. But she, and you know what was most, most impressive was? She actually remembered me. She thought about me. So I must encourage us. Let's remember each other. Let's think about each other. Also, meeting material needs of each other. Materially supporting each other. And if you look at Philippians 4.16, Paul refers to how the Philippians had taken such good care of him financially. He says, even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. They were meeting his needs, material needs. We need to do that with our brothers and sisters, don't we? We have a sister and brother in need. Meet their needs. I also want to say we need to encourage each other. Build each other up. I don't know about you guys, but it doesn't take long for me to get outside the church and get tore down a little bit, doesn't it, you? It doesn't take me long. I was at the Walmart gas station the other day. First off, don't go to Walmart on a Saturday. People just get mean in Walmart on Saturday. They'll run you over the buggies. You just got to be careful. I was in a Walmart going to get gas. And a uh, lady was really coming fast down the the uh, road there in the parking lot and I thought I had plenty of time and I started to drive out and she had to slow down a little bit. Well, man, it made her mad. So she drove right up next to my van like she was going to hit it. And I looked at her and she, my window was down. She stuck her head out and she called me every word that has ever been created. And words I'd never heard before. I had never been called a couple of those things. I went home to my wife and said, baby, I was called something I'd never been called before. It doesn't take long to get tore down outside. But what a great thing to edify each other and build each other up in the life of the church. Now, I saw it this morning. I saw it this morning. I'm not going to name names, but I saw one of our church ladies. She's a sweetheart. She went up to another uh, church member, and she said, did you put such and such, put the flags out in the, in the uh, yard for, you know, last Sunday? And yeah, I did. Well, you did a good job and loved on him. And I thought, yes! Edification. Build each other up. Man, we, we, if we can't do that, we're messing up. We need to build each other up. Just, just saying the good things to each other. And one other thing on this, uh, connecting on an earthly level, share in each other's affliction. Now, again, if you look at 4.14 in Philippians, 4.14, Paul says, Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. 
I want to say that we not only need to think about each other and materially support each other and encourage each other, but we need to share in each other's affliction. Now, I thought about this affliction. How do we do that? And I want to say it's on two levels. The empathy and sympathy. Sometimes it's hard to divide those up, you know, which is which. But the best of my understanding, and I'm not an English major, but sympathy is, is feeling for somebody, feeling sorry for them, uh, feeling sympathetic towards their plight, their problem. That's a very good thing. And we foot, should feel sympathy towards our brothers and sisters in Christ when there's difficulties, when there's problems. I hope that as our folks stood up that have burdens in their life or struggles that you felt sympathy for them and said, oh, bless their heart, I'm going to pray for them and, and you know, God meet their needs. But then there's another level, and it's the empathy level. And that is to put yourself in their place. To, to grasp, to feel, to absorb their hurt, their pain. Empathy. And you know where that really, really has its strong point? Is when somebody has lost someone in their family or somebody's been through cancer or someone's had a wayward child, whatever that may be, and you meet your brother or sister in the body and you say, you know what, I've been there, I've done that. I can empathize with that. And I've been there. I got that in my gut too. And man, God allows you to to minister to them. Sharing in each other's affliction. That's an earthly level connection. How we can develop our spiritual friends within the life of the church. But I want to talk about also connecting on a spiritual level. Now look at, um, again, chapter 1. And if you notice here again in verse 7, he says, in his imprisonment, we talked about on a physical level, and then in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. What Paul says, he says, listen, I'm out defending, I'm defending the truth, and I'm confirming the truth, and you all have stood beside me while I've done that. Many of you have experienced, as you have shared Christ, and as you've been a witness, and as you stand, have you taken a stand for your faith, that people have come against you. Am I right? You've experienced that. People have ridiculed you. And maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you haven't got a promotion. Maybe you haven't been allowed into the, into the group because of your stand with Christ. You understand this. And Paul says, listen, I have taken a stand for the gospel and y'all have stood behind me. In other words, they were his spiritual partners. They had his back. I was talking in the back row this morning. And they said, Eric, we, what was it y'all said back there? We have your back. We're just way back. Something like that, right? Way back. You know what? They had Paul's back. They weren't on his back. Listen, they weren't on his back. They had his back. They didn't turn their back. They had his back. They were there with him on a spiritual level. I just want to say something to you this morning. and Um... I struggle with whether I should say this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it because I feel like this is why, one of the reasons I'm here. Y'all are get a new pastor. Did you know you're going to get a new pastor? Y'all are going to get a new pastor. You're going to get rid of me someday. Hallelujah! Your new pastor is going to come. And Bo, he's going to want to change things. He's going to want to do things different. God's going to speak in his heart and, and he's going to show him things and he's going to want to push you He's going to want to get you out of the, the, where we're kind of focused inside right now because of all that's going on in the life of the church. He's going to want to get you to focus outside. There's going to be change. It's not always going to be comfortable, and you're going to kind of go, ooh. There's going to be some that are going to rise up against your pastor. There's going to be some in this church who will give your pastor a hard time. You say, well, Eric, are you a prophet? No, I've been around too many churches, I know. It's going to happen. Again, that 50 to 80 percent, I'm going to tell you there's some lost people in this church that will rise up against your pastor. You must decide, will you have your pastor's back? 
Here's my challenge to you this morning. Love your pastor, but have your pastor's back. Do not let anybody hurt your pastor or his family. I told the deacons the other day as we met, I said, deacons, I just want to suggest to you, and I forget how exactly I said it, I said, but you need to put a protective ring around your new pastor because there will be some that will affront him. Why? The lion is in the church. Hear me. Stand with your pastor. Well, Eric, why do you say that? I've been there. I've done it. And I've seen those who are energized by Satan come and confront the pastor and try to tear him down and his family. Stand with your pastor. Pray for him. Love him. Undergird him. Surround him. And when someone comes to confront your pastor, you need to say, stop it. Stop it. I struggle whether to share that or not. If you don't remember anything from this message, I hope you'll remember that. Have your pastors back. My uh, two boys, my twin boys, and I know none of you can relate to this, but they used to fight some. And I used to, I'd laugh because they never knocked each other's teeth out or anything, but I would be, I'd hear them and I'd hear that sound. You know, you ever hear that when your boys are just popping each other? They wouldn't hit each other's face, but they hit each other in the back. You hear this, Pah, look, stop it, Pah, look, Pah, chase. You should say, you know, and they're getting after it. And I'd laugh because they're, and they're not, they're doing what's normal. Let me tell you what. You mess with one of those guys, and the other twin's going to be all over you like white on rice. Now, you know, they could talk bad to each other, but if their mom or I were to say something, if I'd say, Paul, you know, Chase has really been acting like a booger bear, I, I tell you, Paul would say, well, Dad, you know, and he would defend his brother. In fact, one of the, they learned really, really young. I'm going to share this with you. Probably shouldn't, but I'm going to. I refinished a cedar chest. Spent days on refinishing the cedar chest my wife had from her youth. Resanded it and then put polyurethane coats on it. I mean, it was gorgeous. And I just put the last polyurethane coat on. It was out in the garage. So a few minutes later, I said, I'm going to walk out and take a look at it. Don't know what I expected. But, but I walked out and I looked. And I looked on top of that cedar chest, and there was water all over the top. I looked up at the ceiling. I said, there's no water. And I said, what? You know, I went down and I touched it. My boys had on top of it. I said, boys! And they walked up. I said, why did you do that? And they just sat blank stare. I said, okay, who did it? And here's exactly what they did. They pointed it, just like pointed at each other. Each one pointed at the other one. They learned out real early that if they were pointing at each other, then I couldn't really know. So I just have to whip them both. You know, you just whip them both. That's what I would do. They had each other's back. We need to have each other's back. Well, how do we, how do we develop this spiritual Level. How do, how, do we, how do we get on the spiritual level, connect on the spiritual level? First off, I'm going to say pray for each other. If you'll notice in Philippians 1, 4, he says, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. He prayed for them all the time. We need to pray for each other, just like we did this morning, didn't we? What did we do? We prayed for each other. Pray for each other. And share Christ and bond from that. Now look at first Philippians, or I keep saying that, Philippians 1, 15 and 16. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. I want to say to you that if we want to connect on a spiritual level, share Christ in bond. Share Christ in bond. Share Christ in bond. You want to know what the greatest cement is between believers on a spiritual level? When you become focused on sharing Christ with other people. When it's a church, you say, you know what? It's not about us. It's about them. We need to see folks get saved. And now that we know that possibly huge percentages of inside of our churches are lost, we need to be focused on the lost. People being saved. 
It is glue on a spiritual level that will bind believers together. When we forget about all the other stuff we worry about, you know, I got in trouble by you all because I was, almost had your, eye, your pew and y'all were going to get on me and, and chew me out. And you, you said, I'm just going to stand here till you move. Of course, we were joking and carrying on, you know. And I said, well, where's your name? I don't see it on the pew anywhere. When we quit worrying about the stupid little stuff and we worry about souls, guess what? It's glue that will suck us together like glue never could. Does that make sense? And Paul knew that. So if we want to connect on a spiritual level, pray for each other, share Christ and bond, and then strive together. Look at chapter 1, verse 27. Look at verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I may, I may remain absent, I will hear of you hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, doing what? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. We've got to ask ourselves, where's our focus? Where's our focus? If we want to connect on a spiritual level, we'll pray for each other, we'll share Christ and bond, and we'll strive one common cause. Who is that cause? Who is that cause? Christ, Jesus, that's our cause. Last thing I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about connecting, connecting with a Jesus level affection. Connecting with a Jesus level connection. Well, Eric, you know, I like that. I like that connecting on an earthly level. And Eric, I like that connecting on a spiritual level. But is it really possible? Great question. Thank you for asking, Bo. It's a great question. I want to say yes if it is done through a Jesus level affection. Look at this word, verse 8, excuse me, verse 7. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, y'all are partakers of grace with me. Then look at verse 8. For God is my witness, how I long for you with all the, what? Affection of Christ Jesus. That word is very, very interesting. It means internal organs or bowels, intestines. It means a deep, deep abiding love that comes from deep within, from the bowels. So I've made you all a love card. I've made you all a love card this morning. Put that love card up, would you? Okay. Now, could you imagine when you started dating your wife or you're dating someone and you sent your girl a card and says, I love you with all my intestines. Boy, she'd be overwhelmed, wouldn't she? <laughs> Y'all like that. Terry, you're blessed, aren't you? But you know what that says? It says this. It says, I love you with something so deep within me that can only come from one place. And that's the Holy Spirit's power. It's the only way. I can't do that humanly. Oh, yeah, I can have affection, which is from my mind and my will and my emotions. I make the decision to, to love you, and it's expected of me. But this is that deep affection, way deep in, that can only come from the Holy Spirit's power. Does that make sense? It's a supernatural affection. Turn to our last text, Romans 5, 5, would you? And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. It's a Holy Spirit power love. We're going to have communion, the Lord's Supper. 
I was reminded as I looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning, and I looked at a text that we seem to forget sometimes. Paul talking about the Corinthian church, how they were coming together for the Lord's Supper. They did it different from us. If we did it like the Corinthian church did it and the early church did it, we'd be doing it a whole lot different. Can't tell you I know exactly how it was done, but here's what we do know. They shared a full meal together. So we'd probably be out in the fellowship hall sitting around tables and we'd be eating a full meal. And there'd be a blessing and before we'd eat, we would bless that and offer it to God in remembrance of Him. And it would be similar to what we do with the elements, but it would be a full meal. I read of a church that does that. They actually pass food down the aisles. But there was a problem in the first Corinthian church. They'd come together and some folks were really hungry, so they'd just plow into the food before all the other people got there. And so they'd eat up the food and some of them were getting drunk. Getting drunk in the church. Off the communion wine. It's just like I saw the folks back working in the kitchen this morning and they were back there guzzling on the grape juice. <laughs> they really weren't but they were back there working on it this morning. That just doesn't happen by itself. There's some faithful saints that do that for us. But there were folks drunk in the church. They were, they were coming and they, they were just gluttons. They were jumping on the food. They, didn't, they weren't mindful of others in the church who were hungry, who didn't have maybe a good income. And this was one way for them to get a good meal at the same time, bless God and, and, and remembrance of Him. And, and Paul admonished him. He said, y'all are getting together and you're getting drunk. You're, 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 you're just rushing in front of other people to get there and eat. Some people are going hungry. In other words, guess who they were focused on? Themselves. Not on Christ. They sure weren't the example of Christian affection for each other. Here's what I'm going to do this morning. We know that the Lord's Supper is to come together and to remember what our Jesus has done for us. Amen? That He died on the cross. Broken flesh. Shed blood. For us. And as we eat that bread and we remember that Christ's body was broken and given for us, and when we drink the wine and we, we remember that that's his blood that was shed, or the grape juice, and that was his blood that was shed for us, we remember those things. And we look forward to when he comes again and we remember him, and we know that someday we're going to join with him in heaven and eat with him in heaven. Amen. But here's what I'm going to say this morning Paul tells us also to search our hearts. Search our hearts. Where are we? And I want to say this morning, let's search our hearts and make sure that we're coming together as friends in Christ with an affection, that deep, gut-level affection. And then as we share this together, we're not only remembering our Christ, but we're remembering the friendship that we share together in Christ. And then we search our hearts and we say, God, forgive me. Because I have ill will against so-and-so and I have a bad heart about so-and-so. And we confess that and get that right because Scripture tells us we need to come before Him with a pure heart when we do this in remembrance of Him. Can we do that this morning? I've already had to deal that with that this week. And I've done that. We're going to stand here shortly and Jim's going to dismiss groups and we're going to take the elements together and we'll be going to two different locations. Am I correct, Jim? And uh, we'll just, before we do that, we're just going to pray and then we're going to remember our Lord Jesus and remember what we're here to do. Amen. Father God.